Food Heals Podcast, episode 194. I don't even want to call this abuse or domestic violence. This is terror. We're living in terror every single day. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to change their status update from hashtag blessed to hashtag OMG even more blessed than yesterday, hashtag loving life. If you experience any of these symptoms, make sure to tweet a Kardashian immediately. All right, welcome Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. And I'm Susie Hardy. Today, we're chatting with best-selling author and speaker, Rosie Aiello. About eight years ago, after a 25-year marriage, Rosie engineered an international escape to save her daughter and herself from domestic violence. Nearly mentally destroyed, she reinvented herself since arriving back in the U.S., started her own business, and became a speaker, a best-selling author, and an international award-winning entrepreneur. Rosie and her daughter are now sharing their powerful story of escape, healing, and freedom in their upcoming memoir called 11 Hours to Freedom. This is such an incredible story and just a very important conversation. And we're going to discuss in depth Rosie's story of really escaping this domestic violence situation that she was in and exactly how to know if you are in an abusive relationship. Not something we've really talked about before, but so pertinent to our health. So I can't wait to share this with you, but shifting gears real quick, Food Heals Nation, I have a question for you. When you scribble in your journal, when you daydream about possibilities, when you map out your ambitious to-do list, do any or all of the following appear for you? I want to grow a wellness business. Start a blog. Start a podcast. Create a moving video series. Sell physical or digital products and earn more. Connect with badass entrepreneurs and grow a powerful inner circle. Or become an influencer. If you said yes, then we want to help you do just that. Today is your lucky day to stop daydreaming and start doing. This is your invitation to our Rise and Bloom Mastermind and Gala. It's April 20th to 21st here in Los Angeles, and this is for our dedicated Food Heals Nation family. We have eight spots available. Sounds incredible, fancy, fun, and exclusive already, right? It does. (laughs) But you don't know the half of it. Let us tell you more about what you will experience. All right. Day one, we're going to meet in an intimate setting in West Hollywood, and we're going to discuss your business and your goals in depth. We'll help you come up with a plan for your next steps. We're going to connect. We're going to collab. It'll be fun. It'll be productive. What else is? We're going to teach you how to build your wellness business through video, audio, photos, and blog content. We're going to teach you beginner and advanced marketing and monetization strategies, how to build partnerships and crazy successful collabs, and more. We're revealing all that's worked for us so you can benefit too. And really, the secret to doing what you love every day and getting paid for it is... Drum roll, please. <laughs> Passive income streams. Woo! Yay! We'll dive into the dirty details of monetization streams, like creating physical products. Which Susie knows all about. Digital products, which I know all about. Membership sites. Online courses. Sponsorship revenue. Affiliates. And so much more. Ah! <laughs> what are you going to teach, Allie? All right. I'm going to teach you the exact step-by-step marketing strategies that we implemented to create a top 25 fitness and nutrition podcast, how we got paying sponsors from launch. We were fully monetized in under 60 days, and we were pulling in 100,000 downloads in under 90 days. And I will teach you how to brand product lines, how to create and sell physical products, how to present yourself confidently and empower your voice, and much more. I love it. So get ready for an incredible two days. We'll also have a lunch and learn with vegan chef and influencer Leslie Durso. And day two is pretty damn incredible. You will not want to miss it April 21st. We'll continue our business powwows as we get glammed for the event of the year, the Humane Society's to the Rescue Gala at Paramount Pictures in Hollywood. Because it's not just what you know, but it's also who you know. 
in my experience, it's only who you know. So what right. makes this gala so amazing? That's so true. This gala, it's I I don't even have words. It is the biggest plant power networking event of the year. You're going to make connections that can really help you skyrocket your business. Like in the past, I've personally had conversations with Cory Booker. He is the Democratic senator from New Jersey, and he's really pushing forward a plant powered agenda. And I've literally had conversations with Kesha about the Me Too movement before Me Too was a thing, before it was a trending hashtag. We were talking about women standing up for themselves in this male-dominated world. Um, I got my picture taken with Steven Tyler of Aerosmith, Kevin Nealon from SNL. It's truly a star-studded event. And all the guests are connected in some way to the plant-based world, whether it's wellness or activism. These are the people that you want to be trading your business cards with. And everyone is accessible and kind, and we're all just there for a purpose. To wear a hot dress and drink champagne? (laughs) Yeah. Susie, you get me. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I do. (laughs) To join us for a two-day mastermind in Los Angeles, go to www.foodhealsnation.com slash mastermind. But first, make sure to email me, info at foodhealsnation.com, and see what discount codes I may have going on. I might have something for you. Tell me about your business and that you're interested and and maybe I can arrange a special discount for you. Act fast. We've only got eight spots. It's going to be very intimate, so we can all get the most out of it. Next up, our interview with Rosie. The Food Hills Podcast starts now. Rosie and her daughter are on a global mission to save a million women and their children from domestic violence because when women are freed from the shackles of abuse, they can thrive along with their children and become happier and more productive. Women hire Rosie as their escape artist because they are stuck in playing small and stuck in their own suffering. She helps them regain their voice and confidence and rebuild their life so that they can create a joyful and prosperous life that they deserve. Welcome, Rosie. Thank you. So great to be with you too. (laughs) I've been looking forward to this. So Rosie, tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, It's so good to be here. I am writing my memoir with my daughter. Uh, It's a mother-daughter memoir called 11 Hours to Freedom. And from that book that we're creating, I've created a women's empowerment program called the Freedom Fulfillment Formula. It takes women through the journey of really taking care of themselves to knowing what's really important so they can reclaim their voice, their confidence, and their courage to really step up and create their own joyful and prosperous life that they deserve. I mean, they don't even feel like they deserve anything Or they may even be kind of successful, but there's still that voice in them. Or when they go home, it's like, I am just a fraud. It's not really me. You know, they've been been put down by so much from the outside that they've now started to do that great job to themselves. It's such a crime, you know, to have all these fabulous women not be their, their full selves. That's what I'm doing now. And as I'm expanding this program. I can totally relate to that. And I'm sure uh, many Food Heals Nation listeners can as well. Feeling like a fraud is huge in our society because we are always on the go trying to make something of ourselves, trying to create this career, trying to become influencers, trying to be authors. And sometimes we ask ourselves, who am I to do this, right? And I love that you are tackling that question head on because we are all valuable and we are all meant to do whatever it is we want to do. And there's not a fraud. You can't be a fraud if you're yourself. That's true. And, you know, the other thing, too, is like, you know, addressing their limiting beliefs. And and I kind of like to say because I was in a highly abusive relationship, it was like having limiting beliefs on steroids. You know, it's like, it was just, just bring it on, you know, <laughs> let's see, how, let's see who could be the best at putting Rosie down, you know, <laughs> was it Rosie? Then my voice became his voice as I kept learning. And then I started to believe everything he said. So then it's like, well, then he, it must be true. So I started to create deep beliefs about myself and it's, it's taken a lot of work and effort to really reclaim who I am. So Rosie, can we delve a little bit into your story just because I know, um, it's going to help other women that are listening that either have in the past or are experiencing abuse to hear what you dealt with and how you came through it. Can you give us a little background as to how it evolved and and how you got out? Sure. I'll just step back a little bit. You know, I'm from California and I met my husband to be in California. He's, he's a Lebanese. He's a Christian Lebanese. 
I was already working in Silicon Valley in California. I had a great job. I was going up the, the career path pretty fast. I was in corporate finance. Um, he was somebody I had met in college earlier. We reconnected. I left my family, my friends, and my career to move to the Middle East with him, where I lived for about 25 years. I lived about half the time in Saudi Arabia and about half the time in Beirut, Lebanon, where he was from. From the get-go, it was abusive in the sense that, well, first of all, abusers will isolate. And I had like severe isolation because I was just pulled out of the country, right? I, was, I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a support system whatsoever. I bet you didn't even, did you know the language? I, well, they speak English there, but I did learn Arabic and I'm fluent in French, which helped when I was in Lebanon. So I do, I do speak Arabic and like I said, I speak French. So I was okay with the languages and they speak a lot of, a lot of English in that country. They're quite fluent. So I think, you know, a, a, a challenge for, for women is they, they become isolated. And then for me, you know, even, even on our honeymoon, which we took in Europe on the way to the Middle East, it was like, oh, I don't like your wedding dress. And I really didn't like your hair either. And I didn't like this, you know, and I'm just feeling like crap. But I have to tell you, I was married 18 years before I even knew I was in an abusive relationship. I mean, he would sit me down and scream at me for hours and tell me how horrible I was. But I thought, and he just said, well, you know, if you can just apologize and, and promise to be better, it'll be okay. So what did I do? I, I, I did that wow. because, hey, you know, I'm a performer. You know, I was, did really well in corporate. You know, I want to, well, of course I can do it, you know, right? It's a challenge. I can do this. Not realizing how manipulative or controlling he was. I just thought I just wasn't good enough. And so I, well, I'm here. I got to make him happy. And I didn't know what it was just because I kept trying to be better. I tried to be better. I tried to be better and it never worked. And I wasn't happy, but I just thought, gosh, you know, I just don't know how to make this man happy. He's always angry at me. Or it got to the stage where literally, I'm not joking, literally, if I was walking across the living room and I just took a deep sigh or just, you know, breathe heavily or whatever, he would yell at me for the way I breathe. Wow. Oh my gosh. Was he violent towards you? Was it just emotional and verbal? It was It was primarily emotional and verbal. It was also financial. He controlled all the money. He goes, Rosie, you are, you know, you're an American citizen. I'm not an American citizen. You know, he had a green card. He goes, if we put your name on the accounts and we'll be charged all these taxes, so we won't have your name on any of the financials whatsoever. And I did not get any money from that. Now, getting to the physical abuse, um, and our editor says, like, don't discount this, because it's funny how I want to say, oh, he only did it a couple of times. I mean, I shouldn't even say that, right? Because it's it's not, it's never acceptable. It's but, never acceptable. Right? And it's like, it's like, well, I should say, he did it twice. <laughs> and what he did is, like, I remember very clearly where I was. We were in the kitchen. It was in Saudi Arabia. And he squeezed my arm so tightly that there were black and blue marks um, that you could see his fingerprints on my arm from the black and blue that he, he did. And he says, Oh, Rose, I just, I had to shut you up. You know, I just had to oh. do that. And I'm alone. It's not like I could go to some service or something. I'm in a different country. I'm in an Arab country. It's not like I can just walk out the door. Yeah. It sounds like you were very trapped. Yeah, I was. You know, I was and, and, you know, he would go out with his friends. And then if I went out with, you know, tried to make friends, he would get you know angry with me. You're, you're never home. You're never taking care of me. You're abandoning the family. It's like, oh, my God, you know, I don't know anybody here. I'm trying to make friends. I could work for his company, but he never paid me. And then when he decided to pay me, he took the money and I had a house in California. And he just said, oh, we'll just use it for that. He decided what to do with my money. So I never saw the check. So lots of financial abuse. And you you didn't know anything at the time about what it was like to be in an emotionally abusive relationship. Like, you know, there's those quizzes, right, where you can find out if you're in an emotionally abusive relationship. And it's like, do they control you through the money? Um, do they isolate you from friends, family, making new friends, uh, things like that? So did you have any idea that you were in an abusive relationship or did you just think, I got to make this work? I didn't, you know, again, I'm in a foreign country, so I didn't have access. There was no internet when I was there. Um, there were some in books in English, but I, I, you know, when you get married, you don't expect 
the person who's supposed to love you to be abusive to you. You're not looking for it. I wasn't looking for it. I didn't grow up that way. So it, it, I just thought I wasn't good enough. And I, you know, he just said, he, as long as I apologized and said I would do better, then he quieted it down. But before then, it was like a huge storm that was just constantly hitting me. So no, I didn't know until one visit to the United States when I must have been in the bookstore by myself. You know, thank God for bookstores. I mean, I'm as guilty as the last person to buy my books online, but going, being able to physically go to a bookstore and just walk along and see the titles saved my life. You know, I got a book. The first book I got was actually called Walking on Eggshells. That turned out to be a book about borderline personality disorder, which he doesn't have. And it had a bibliography. And from the bibliography, I discovered the book called The Verbally Abusive Relationship by Patricia Evans. And she's now a very dear friend of mine. And I have to say between, you know, of her and her, her group, her forum, and my brother, I was able to, to get out. But that was when I first learned what it was. I remember I hid the book in like five layers of opaque plastic bags and, you know, and hid it. And I would take it out of the closet and I would go into the extra, you know, the guest bedroom bathroom, lock the door, sit on the toilet seat and open it up and read the book and think, oh my God, this is my freaking life. It was like, she was describing, you know, how they are just like what you were saying. Is he doing this? Is he doing that? And I thought, oh my God, this is it. And I, and I didn't want to accept It's like, no, we got to make this marriage work. We have to make the marriage work. And it was so painful when I realized it wasn't going to work. But my daughter in the Middle East, custody automatically goes to the father, you know, after the age of seven. So yeah, so there's no custody battle there, you know, it's done. And when the child is young, they could be with the mother. But after that, you know, until they turn major, they're with their father. So I didn't want to leave without my daughter. I would have never done that. Well, there's that movie, that Sally Fields movie that was a book first. Yeah. Called not without not without my daughter. And it was it took place in Iran. But same kind of story. She married an a, a Iranian in Michigan. He was a doctor. Yeah. He wanted to they he he tricked her. He wanted to go home and introduce their daughter because they were living in Michigan. He was totally Americanized. They wanted to live uh, or he wanted to introduce his daughter and his wife to his family in Iran. And this was back when um oh, this is in the eighties, early eighties. Right. Um you right. know, travel restrictions are different there. And once they got there, he took her passport and women couldn't travel without permission of their, their, either their husband or their father or their brother. That's right. And so she was trapped there. That's so right. literally just the words you just said. She, she couldn't leave. Same thing. She didn't want to leave without her daughter. Yeah. And it's funny because when I used to say that people say, oh, you should hear about this movie and this story. Cause I didn't know anything because I've been out of the States for 25 years. So I didn't know, but I eventually heard of her story and it's true. You know, so you, you know, I was not going to leave. So I had to wait till my daughter turned major. Then she started the university and she came to me one day and said, mom, you've got to get me away from my abusive father because he was treating her the same way. He was, you know, insulting her, belittling her, putting her down, stalking her. She would try to, you know, she's a kid at the university. She's on Facebook, you know, and he would call her up in the, at one o'clock in the morning and scream at her. What, what are you doing on the phone at this hour? You should be studying. Well, of course, now she's so upset she couldn't study. So it was just one thing after the other. So you asked me, did I know? So the answer was not for the first 18 years of my marriage until I got that book. And then I started to read as much as I could. When my daughter came to me that day, it was in April of 2009. Then I said, okay. And then in four months, I planned the escape of our lives. I mean, this must have taken so much courage. You know, it's funny, you know, people tell me that. And when you're in the middle of it, you, you don't even think about it. I, I, I guess I must have garnered the courage because I would tell myself every day, a hundred times a day that my daughter and I deserve a happy and joyful life. I don't have to be a martyr. I said that mantra, not even knowing about mantras. I didn't know about any of this stuff. I didn't know about mantras. I didn't know about limiting beliefs. I didn't know anything. I just created it myself because I felt guilt-ridden in a way. You know, here I am hiding things. I mean, planning the whole escape is tension, you know, like on a scale of zero to 10, like on, you know, stress level, mine was probably like 110. But, you know, knowing that 
I didn't have to. This is my life. Your life is precious. Your time here on earth is precious. It's like, I don't want to live this way. I don't want to live this way. So and you shouldn't have to. No. And, you know, that's, you know, the mission, you know, that we have, my daughter and I have is to help these other women. But I just wanted to get out and create a new life because I felt that we were not going to live. There was just no doubt. My, my daughter and I were just both suicidal. And I mean, it was just like, if we stayed, I don't think I'd be alive today. Wow. And what did the, uh, what did the great escape look like? I outsmarted him. Simple. <laughs> There's a lot of details to the escape, which you will know, be in the book. But briefly, I had four months because every, every summer, as a family, the three of us, we would travel to the United States so I can visit my family and friends. And, and I met him in California, so he had friends here too. And like uh, Susie was saying, you know, I couldn't really travel by myself. And Lebanon is a very tiny country. So some people said, well, why could you just, you know, get a ticket and fly? Well, where could I get a ticket, you know, an airplane ticket? You know, they probably would know who he was, you know, and word spread. So I couldn't take a chance on anything. This is literally a movie. They should make a movie out of your life. I'm like riveted. I'm like, what is she going to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about that stuff. So you know, people in the Hollywood, you know, like Reese Witherspoon or, or you know, Greta Gerwig, you know, we're all, we're all over that. She does have her own production company and she is a feminist. So there might be some synergy there. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's why we, we love what she's doing. And so anyway, so over a month, over a course of four months, I started to pack things and I would back into my little trusty bathroom there, I would go in boxes that I had taken from the grocery stores and I would pack stuff. And I only packed like the first things I took were the photo albums and then, you know, some clothes and then some books. I mean, really not much, you know, you really come down to like, what's important. See, I really would have wanted the China, but then when I got here, it's like, I don't really want that. And you really understand that things aren't important, right? My freedom and my daughter's freedom was the most important thing. So slowly I, I did that. I packed things up. And mind you, this is another thing that women who are in this situation, uh, the problem they have, in those 18 years of marriage, no one, I mean, nobody knew of my plight. So after I read the book, I told my brother and my two best friends in the United States. So in 18 years, only three people knew. And I then- I interject. Was he like nice to you in front of other people? Oh, yeah. He was very nice. He was, you know, the typical charmer. He was- you know, everybody would say, you guys are the perfect couple. You, you travel, you do all these things, you know, he's so, he's so much fun. We would entertain a lot. Uh, so on the outside, right, typical, great persona. I used to say I lived under political terrorism because I lived in the Middle East, so I know political terrorism. I've been through it, and I've probably seen more bombs and bullets than the average soldier in the United States, and I'm sure of that because I've looked at the stats. And I lived in my own personalized terrorist camp because I don't even want to call this abuse or domestic violence. This is terror. We're living in terror every single day, right? Yeah. And it's just so interesting because people who often, often, not always, people who are abusers and people who turn out to be murderers later in life, I'm not saying you know your ex-husband was a murderer by any means, I'm just saying they often possess common traits of being sociopaths. And sociopaths are extreme charmers. They can charm someone into loving them. They can charm people into giving them raises and making their way up in the business world and the social world and all these kinds of things. And then secretly, they are, they are terrorists, whether they are abusers or hurting people in different types of ways, hurting animals, you know, they have this secret and then that secret becomes your secret. Yeah. I mean, I, that's exactly true. I mean, he was, or is, I should say, um, you know, narcissist, a sociopath. And one thing is like, you can't love them into being good. Right. They're never going to change. They're never going to change. And it's hard for women to accept that it, it took me a while to, to understand it and accept it as well. We want to change everyone. We want to fix them. We want to make them better. It's a part of our nature as women, I feel. I don't know any women who aren't trying to change or fix someone until, you know, unless you go real deep and you self-reflect and realize that's not really possible. But I feel like that's one of the biggest lessons of my life as well is that you cannot change someone. 
you can lead by example and hope that they follow. But in the case of abusers and things that are this extreme, they are never going to change. And so you have to change and get out and do the great escape like you did. Yeah. So continuing on in the story a little bit uh, to not leave it too much. So anyway, we left as a family. Okay. We left as a family going to the United States. In that time, I had already talked to attorneys, both in Lebanon and the United States, in California. I was ready to talk to them. I had made lists and lists of things I had to do. I'd copy critical documents. I mean, I had my act together. My brother was my sounding board because I couldn't think really well throughout the whole episode because your, your brain literally gets rewired by the abuse. So it makes it really hard for you to think, uh, you know, all the neurochemicals and, you know, you probably know that better than I do, but there's a lot of impact that happens to a human being when they're being abused. So we, we go through Paris because there are no direct flights to the United States from Lebanon anyway. So we go Beirut, Paris, and then Paris, San Francisco. Our book is called 11 Hours to Freedom and the 11 Hours because it was 11 hour flight from Paris to San Francisco. We arrive on San Francisco International Airport. Now, <laughs> because I guess we, you know, we lived in the Middle East, we got chosen to go through customs. And this is the first time in all the years I traveled that I had two full suitcases packed with all my stuff. And he even kind of commented, gee, you're taking a lot of stuff this time. And I go, oh, it's just lots of gifts for everybody. So when we got chosen, I oh, just selected. I don't want to say chosen. That makes it sound like it's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, all right. So when we got selected to, you know, like, oh, for a custom inspection, like, oh, my God, you know, I'm just I'm sweating. I'm not thinking like, well, so what if he finds out, you know, I'm leaving? Him. I was going to say you're already now you're in your country. Right. But see, I'm not thinking that way because you're, I'm, I have to finish the whole thing. I, you don't feel safe. I don't feel safe because he's still with me. I was scared to death by the time we were ready to leave. I, I didn't know what he was going to do. So, you know, the customs agent is opening up our bags and he's going through and I'm, you know, I go, oh my God, he's just going to see, he's going to see our stuff, you know, and then he's going to start asking questions, but he didn't notice anything. A big sigh of relief. So then we go through the doors, you know, the, the doors open automatically and I knew exactly where my brother would be. We had arranged for him to pick us up at the airport, which was not common for my brother to meet us at the airport. But in Lebanon, it's really common for your family to meet you and greet you, even if you've been gone a week. So he wasn't suspicious the moment he saw my brother. Then my daughter and I, we rolled our luggage carts behind my brother. I told my brother to go over to my husband and tell him, you know, Rosie's been upset. She needs some time away. I was so afraid. I couldn't even have my brother tell him that she's leaving you forever. I couldn't get the words out. I had to be work with a, with a psychologist for a while before I could voice myself. That's, that's what I wanted. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine the fear of what, of what his reaction would be. And so then we turned around and walked away and left him standing in the airport. Wow. This is such a movie. And there's a lot more to the story, uh, obviously, but that's pretty much the escape, girls. <laughs> well done. <laughs> you can call me a great escape artist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do thereafter? And this is a kind of a broad question, so just pick whatever works in terms of response. But what did you do to rebuild yourself after all of that? I mean, the the biggest the biggest thing was for you to take that step and say, no more, I'm taking my daughter and we're going back to my country and he's not going to be a part of my life anymore. That's the biggest, that's the biggest step. But then what did you do to rebuild your confidence, your self-esteem? You mentioned therapy. Did you go to therapy? Absolutely. I went to therapy. We were both diagnosed with um, pretty severe PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, my daughter had, well, I guess we both had depression. I mean, I was on, if I saw a car of one, like he drove, I would just break down for days because the trigger was so bad. But, you know, obviously got an attorney for that, for the divorce and everything else. But, you know, I worked with the, with a therapist and I thought, okay, Rosie, you know, now you're here. Cause I didn't think about the next step. I just like, I'm just getting out. And one thing I do want to share before the, I say the next step, one thing is that never for a split second, did I not think the plan wouldn't work. 
it was just, it was like, there was not an option that it wouldn't work. You know how you have these limiting beliefs. Oh, I don't know if I can do it. There was no option. There was no plan B. I only had plan A and I knew 100% it was going to work, but I didn't know how I just knew it would. So that's how I got here. (laughs) (laughs) So to rebuild myself, so I started, well, I'd been out of the country for 25 years. You know, I knew I couldn't go back into high tech. I was, I was in my late fifties. So I wasn't a young, young chick here. You know, c- competing against, you know, somebody in their 30s and stuff. So I started to go to workshops, learn what my skills were. Um, I took lots of free classes, just tons of free classes and, you know, tried to write my resume and people would say, God, Rosie, you have such great skills. You know, you can get a job anywhere. Well, I arrived in the summer of 2009. That's the great recession we had. So I'm facing, I've been out of the country I'm old compared to everybody else. And we're in the middle of the recession. And I thought, how am I going to write my resume? So I thought, I guess it's too hard to write a resume. So I think I'll just become an entrepreneur. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) That's why we're friends. (laughs) So, and I swear, that's the truth. It's like, I don't know how to write a resume. You know, I mean, they would tell me to do it. It's like, I don't know. It doesn't even, how can I put into words everything that I knew? So that was my alternative. Okay, I'll become an entrepreneur. (laughs) And I started to, you know, learn about business. And I started to learn about PowerPoints. I mean, I knew zero, like zero. Uh, I built my first website. I was so proud of myself. (laughs) (laughs) What platform did you build it on? Just curious. WordPress. Wow, WordPress is tough to teach yourself. It is. I speak from experience. I walked away from that. I have WordPress and I still have to call my web girl and go, how do I do this? How do I do that? (laughs) Well, I'll teach a girl. (laughs) And then I started to, you know, network and then, you know, meet people, got into other formal networking organizations. I became a speaker. I became an author. You know, I've I've written, I've co-written a number of books. I've written a number of e-books. I got four years after I was in business, an international business award from eWomen Network. And... I guess the rest is history. You know, I'm a very forward looking person. (laughs) I mean, you have to be. Congratulations. You're like a badass babe. And I'm so impressed by everything that you have overcome and accomplished because how many people would spiral into a deep depression? Even if you get out, then you have to start over. Like you said, during a depression, it just sounds overwhelmingly hard. So I just want to give you (laughs) mad props for yeah, turning this Thank you. Around. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I, there were lots and lots of challenges and I had to deal with my daughter who was going through, you know, major depression and the triggers. And then she go into disassociated states. And I remember the first time that happened, it's like you're passed out, but you're not. Uh, so it's like all these, all these things. And I'm kind of impatient. It's like, well, let's get going. I want to you know, get the business going, but you just have to take things in stride. And how is she doing in this day and age? She's doing much better, uh, doing much better, but she still has a little ways to go, I would say, a little ways to go. I mean, super powerful when, you know, you get her on this topic, man, she can own the stage. She can really own the stage. It takes a long time. And then even then, like I've had PTSD, but more from more, I was mugged twice in my life. That was much more concentrated, very fast, very short from strangers, but still, it still falls in the same category. And with things like that, I, I think you have to almost... Like for a long time, I try to forget it, repress it, pretend it didn't happen. And I don't think that like that works sometimes as a tool if you want to just kind of numb out. But after a while, I realized that like that's certain things like that are sacred wounds that if you honor, like you accept and honor and completely just be like, this is a part of my story. This happened. Um, this is had, has now made me who I am today, which is hopefully stronger, you know, um, and I'm sure she'll get to that point as well. And grieve and grieve the situation. Yeah. You know, part of the problem, you know, and I, I lived with this, you know, is that women live in, they became their own prisoners because they live in shame so much. I mean, I was so ashamed of the situation I sort of got myself into. I didn't want to tell anybody. And that was such a mistake. I mean, this is sort of my mission too, is to create a safe community for these women to realize that you are not alone. And if anybody, you know, your listeners who are listening is like, if any of this rings true is to reach out to somebody. I mean, whether it's me or your Susie or, you know, Allison or somebody that's close to you, because the worst thing is to be alone in all of this because you feel like you're the only one. You don't 
and you, you make up stories that you think you can't get out. You think there is absolutely no way. You know, I, I think of myself 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I was still back there, you know, and to look at my life now, I could have never in a million years have imagined then where, where I am now. Never. So there are great possibilities. And our book is divided into three sections. And the first section is the flight for freedom, which is um, that first part of during the flight. And, I, and then we do a lot of flashbacks of what led up to the escape. And the second part is called the fight for freedom. And that really is, you know, it's not something you can just do once in a while. You know, I am very conscious of my freedom every day, probably more than the average person, because I really had to fight to get my freedom. But it's like, what do you create in your life on a regular basis to maintain your freedom? Are, are you, you know, we have the Me Too movement now. It's like, are you really sharing your voice in the most powerful way? Or are you, you know, maybe sometimes you dumb it down or you don't say anything because you're afraid of what someone else might think. You're afraid of what maybe the repercussions might be. But at the same time, you're diminishing yourself. Yes, we have to speak our truths. And when we are truthful, we are ourselves. And when we are truthful, we can help transform ourselves and others and ultimately the world. And the farther away we are from our truth, the farther away, away we are from healing. And I really think that that is so much of your story, so much of my story in a completely different way. But coming back to this happened, Susie's trauma happened, my trauma happened, your trauma happened for a reason so that we can then help others. And if we deny it, if we diminish it, if we hold back, if we, like you said, dumb it down, then we're only doing a disservice to ourselves and others whom we could be helping. So I think the importance of telling your story is like number one. And you are an escape artist for others. People work with you to escape these abusive relationships. Can you tell us about what you do? And if someone's listening right now, like what they can do, can they contact you? What what steps can they take? Sure. Um, of course they can contact me. They can do that at, at 11 hours to freedom at gmail.com. And, you know, I'll be happy to, to talk to them and what they can do. First of all, if they can plan it, it's better. I know sometimes people don't have a chance, but if they're listening now is to start getting all the financial information you possibly can get, bank accounts, insurance policies, your your car policies, everything that you share, and even things that you don't share, things that are just his. And I know some women don't have that access, but get what you can. Get all the information, your passports, you know, make copies of everything, any kind of a document. What I started to do, because remember I told you, I didn't have access to the money except what he gave me. So over a course of those four months, because I didn't have much, when he would give me money for like groceries and stuff, I would just start to take another $10 here, $10 there or whatever. And I would just kind of like, I know there are some husbands who, who match your receipt to what you spend. So obviously you can't do that. But the most important thing is reach out to somebody. This is probably the most important thing is don't do this alone um, because you can't think literally because your brain has been scrambled by the abuse is to reach out to somebody. What if you reach out to someone and they don't believe you because they've been charmed by that person or they have their own opinions? What if they don't believe you? What, what do we do then? Go to somebody else because if they're, they don't believe you, don't, don't waste your time. And I know it's kind of scary. It's like, who can you do? That's why, you know, they can reach out to me because, and I, and I have a whole network of people they can, you know, talk to. There are the d domestic violence hotlines just Google. We'll, we will have a whole resource section in our book, but go to the domestic violence hotlines, it, whether it's in your community or the national hotline. There are tons. The other thing is if you are on your phone, well, if you're on your phone, it's probably okay because I didn't have that. I didn't have a phone back then. If you're on your computer, I don't know how controlling your husband might be, is to clear your history so that if he goes to your computer, he doesn't see what you've looked up. There's lots of things. So so that's, you know, one thing to do that they can start doing now if they are in it. And then I work with women now who've been, who've gotten out, you know, usually the women who've gotten out, you know, maybe had some therapy. And then I help them now reclaim that voice, their confidence and their courage so they can really live their life to the fullest so they can create that joyful life so they can see if there's hope and they have the steps to move forward. 
I know that um, this may be confidential, so you don't have to answer this, but if you are able to tell us anything, are there people that you have helped overcome abusive relationships now that you've been doing this? And can you tell us a little bit about what that entailed? Women have, um, not everyone's ready to hear it. And now I'm, because I know all the signs, it's, it's like, I've just got this, I have a radar. It's like, I, I know like within a matter of a few sentences, whether the person is in an abusive relationship or not. And in fact, I was talking to, to a woman and I was telling her my story. And as she listened to my story, we were just having a casual conversation. She told me later, she goes, she, and she's been divorced for 12 years, mind you, divorced 12 years. And it wasn't until she heard my story that she realized that she had been in an abusive marriage prior to that. She didn't know the signs. Wow. And of course, now she's, she goes, no wonder I'm having all these troubles. So creating the awareness is such a huge step. In another case... I encourage the woman, I go, look, you deserve to be treated with kindness all the time and respect and honor. Yes. There's everybody has all the emotions. We have anger. We have happiness. We have sadness. We have joy. It's what we do with those emotions. And when the partner gets angry and they scream at you or put their hand around your neck or throw you down, it's never right. Never it's never okay. I agree with you. And, you know, this is really making me think because I do know people and I've debated this with girlfriends of mine, the difference between, and I would love your thoughts on this, an abusive relationship and a toxic relationship and when you have to get out. And so obviously if they hit you, you get out, but there's also some that are like, well, or are they, or are there none, you know, can you tell me kind of the difference between those two and what are the most red flags and what are some that, you know, maybe you could still work out in therapy. Could you talk, talk a little bit about that? The, I, I think what's important is, you know, for the women to know what the signs are. And this is what I sort of teach in like an honoring your own self, you know, first, you know, learning to have, how to, you know, know what your values are and how to honor yourself. And abuse and toxic are pretty aligned. The news is toxic, right? Anything that's bad going into your psyche is going to be bad. It's going to be toxic. To me, it's like poison. You know, it's poison. When, when somebody is yelling at you and doing this, this is poison entering into your whole system. It's getting into your cells, literally, and making you ill. Uh, this is why, you know, being on your podcast is so important because, you know, I hope people understand the impact to their health. I, I know we're sort of segueing here, but I, I want to bring it up. I have spoken to I have hundreds of women, you know, all over the world. And I haven't done a statistical analysis, a formal statistical analysis, but I've done enough. And without exception, every woman that I have spoken to who's been in an abusive relationship has had a major health issue, not a minor one, something major. You know, I had, I was diagnosed with some other stuff and I, women have had cancer. There's a direct correlation. So this relationship is killing people, right? Yeah. Just like. Our mutual friend, Jolyn, who we also had on the podcast, who you know, yes. she attributes the fact that she had cancer to this anger turned inward um, from being in a relationship. And that's yes. just one example, but there are countless examples and people aren't always making the connection, but the connection exists whether you believe in it or not. Because, you know, when to get out is always the first time it happens, but we keep hoping, right? Remember, we keep going on that, that, that little thin line of hope that, oh, he's going to get better. He's going to get better. Or you know, I love him. You know, if, I, if I'm just better, that's how mine was. Oh, if I'm better, you know, uh, uh, you know, then he won't be mad at me anymore. And they're not always cruel to you. They give you lots of love. It's the, it's the roller coaster. It's the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, it's like, oh, well, I really love this guy. You can, I'm going to tell you something that you can actually envision. So you can either just put, you know, just put your hands up and spread them out. So let's say your left hand is a really, really good guy. I mean, you just, he's the charmer. He's smart. He's brilliant. And this is what you fell in love with. And he's so fabulous. He's so fabulous. And then on your right hand, this is the guy who screams at you and insults you and puts you down and tells you you're, you're crap and you can never do anything right. And you're, you're never a partner and all this stuff. And maybe he hits you and what have you. And it's like, and then you put your, those, those two hands together. And it's just the same 
It's the same person with just two coins, you know, same, same side of two coins. And then you're going to fold your fingers down like you're clasping, almost like you're praying. Now try to pull the, those, your hands apart. You can't pull them apart. So the thing is, is that if you want the good stuff, the bad stuff will always be there. You can never disengage it. And it's the bad stuff that's going to kill you. You know, it's going to destroy your psyche and it's going to damage your health. So I want women to really think about that. And Rosie, may I ask, are you in a healthy, loving relationship now? I am. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) It's so sweet of you to ask. And I, again, you think that's never going to happen. Man, when I first came here, don't even let me, I didn't want to look at a man. All men were evil. (laughs) They were cruel. They were horrible. I have. And it's so sweet. He is so kind. He's so thoughtful. It's like, oh my God. And it's so funny because in the beginning, he would trigger me a lot because he was so kind. It's like I wasn't used to be treated with kindness. It wasn't comfortable for me. And this is another problem for women. It's like, whoa, something must be wrong here. You know, we've been together for almost a year now. (laughs) Isn't that great? Amazing. Yes. There's hope. Everyone listening, there's so much hope wherever you are right now. You can get out, whether it is you heal the relationship if it's not abusive and you're just having issues or whether it's absolutely abusive and toxic and you need to get yourself out. But um, I love, I love, love, love that you are now in such a vibrant and powerful place in your relationship. And can you, you know, I can't wrap up without telling everyone what are the exact things that we have to look for? And if you have these things, you have to examine yourself and your relationship right now. What are some of like the undeniable warning signs? What we talked about earlier, you know, one is the, is he always blaming you for everything? Okay. You know, it's like, no matter what you do, you're being blamed for it. Is he controlling the money in any shape or form? Like mine was, you know, oh, you can have as, well, you know, it wasn't you could have as much as you wanted, but, you know, he gave me money to spend. I couldn't spend on myself, but for the family. So is there any kind of control of the money? Is he making excuses for you not to go see your friends or your family? Is he insulting them? Is he insulting your family and friends? I had that a lot. Is he doing things that, you know, he can do them, but then when you want to do them, he makes excuses for you not to do them? Is he making it difficult for you to get out of the house? Like to do anything? My, you know, I got my pleasure from grocery shopping. That was where I had my peace is just being able to go grocery shopping. So these are some of the bigger signs, obviously any kind of a physical abuse, which is a little bit more obvious to, to the person. See, so mine, was, it was so insidious. It's like burning, you're, you're boiling to death and you don't even realize it. Cause it's like, I feel like there is a fine line but before it hits physical abuse, if it's going to go that route, between we are not getting along, but we may be able to fix it because blame is one that could happen in an abusive relationship or a non-abusive relationship when two people are blaming each other because they have unresolved issues with within themselves. So I guess my question is, is like, when is there still hope? And when is there not? Obviously, if it's physical, goodbye. Right. Obviously, if they're isolating you from friends and family, goodbye. Like some of them are absolutes and then some of them are still, well, they're in a gray area. So I I just want I, I just want everyone listening to be able to kind of think for themselves. Am I on a scale of one to 10? Am I in a 10 abusive or am I in a one? This is still fixable. We're just having issues, a relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's hard to answer. I mean, wouldn't you think, I mean, that's very individual because A, we're taught that once you're married, or at least I was, I I realized this for myself, once you're married, things are going to be beautiful and perfect and you're going to be happy forever. Disney, you know, like, (laughs) yeah, we're when that's all you have to do is you have to get there. You have to find the right person. And I took my time finding the right person. And that's not true. It's work. All relationships are work. And then on top of that, uh, I think at least women have this big expectation that being married, that one relationship is going to fulfill you completely. And that's the whole Jerry Maguire thing. It's like, you complete me, right? That's a bloat of bullshit. So <laughs> like, then if you get into beyond that, like everybody, everybody's raised differently. Everybody had different parents um, with their own issues. And, and, and I've done enough therapy on my own. And I was a psych major that, that people learn their par- parenting or they learn how to love from watching their parents and they either do similar things or they do the exact opposite if it was really toxic really abusive 
if they were able to recognize that. Some people repeat that. So that's a hard question to answer, but I would I would say I would say if there's still respect and tenderness, maybe it can be repaired and a desire to to hear your partner. And it can go both ways. I wanted to say this too, because we we get some comments sometimes where we don't address the men. I know of some men um, I've seen in my life where I feel like they are emotionally abused by their wives. Oh, yeah. That they're the ones, not physically. I've never heard of any man being abused physically. I'm sure it exists, but it can go both ways. And I've definitely seen that in my experience where the wife is yes. the one that's, I don't know what goes on beyond, beyond closed doors, but I've seen it both ways. So um, I, I think if there's still respect and tenderness and ability to listen and willingness to hear your partner, then maybe it can be fixed. Otherwise, I don't know. Yeah, you bring up really good good points here. And yes, and yes, I know men have, have also been in abusive situations. I've talked to quite a number of them. So the key thing I want to express here um, are two things. One, it's the pattern you have to look for. Obviously, in any relationship, there's going to be a disagreement, you know, you know, out of whatever anger, you're going to just blame somebody. But look at the pattern. Is there a pattern that that person is consistently blaming you and especially blaming you when you know you didn't do anything wrong? Is the person, you know, when you try to explain what happens is totally unwilling to listen to your side. So the the key to any kind of healthy relationship is to be able to resolve conflicts in a mature way, which means you don't name call, you don't insult, you deal with the present issue presently. You don't bring back, you don't bring the past into the future and on everyone's past transgressions. And then you, then you're, you're blaming them now and you have a talk about it. So if the person and if the person can apologize sincerely and you see a change in behavior, remember people who are narcissists and sociopaths are very good in the moment or moments to show really kindness and love and everything else. But then, then the pattern hits that bam, you're slammed down. So you can't tell from a single moment, but you can tell from many moments. And if they're blaming you, putting you down, insulting you, it's like, really, why do you need to do that? And even if people grew up that way, I just have to say, that's not a healthy way. It's not a way to behave. We have to treat each other kindly. We can be angry. Remember what I was talking about before? Of course we can be angry, but you can be angry and saying, this is what upsets me. Or you can be angry and start lashing insults, throwing things across the room. Which one's going to be more effective? I love this conversation, you guys. I can't even, I can't, I'm so excited to talk about this because I feel like all my girlfriends need to hear this. And what if, Rosie and Susie, what if both partners are partaking in this type of behavior? I mean, I feel like the answer is obvious, but I want to hear your perspectives because I know people who claim to 100% love each other and they break down doors and throw shit at each other. And like, I remember this is um, when I was growing up and my dad and my mom and dad didn't fight. I grew up in this like happy household, which I know now is rare, but I grew up thinking you can love each other and not fight. And there was this couple that lived down the street not when I was a child, but when my parents moved to the beach when I was in college and they would come out with us, they would come over for dinner, for drinks, whatever. My dad would have a lot of parties and they acted wonderfully. And one time I saw them like fighting so bad. And I said to my dad, this is what I saw. And he said, yeah, that's how they love each other. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And he said, yeah, like I, he, my dad had to fix their door. Like they had both broken things, shattered things. And then yet they were still in a, supposedly loving relationship. But I remember being really confused and being like, they should break up. No, <laughs> no, that's well, well, I want to hear what you guys think. I really do. No, I don't. I don't think that's um, doesn't sound healthy to that's me. That's Okay. <laughs> no, it's that's toxic. It is. But in this case, it's like maybe there's not an abuser abusee relationship. It's like they're both toxic abusers. It's just an interesting discussion. I, I find the way that humans treat each other fascinating. That's just why I bring this up. So, I mean, something like that is like, kind of a sick dance. Yeah, I agree. And if, if there isn't one that's going to say, hey, or even a family member that witnesses it, that says, hey, this isn't okay. <laughs> you know, just listen to how you were saying it, Allison. 
you know, you were confused. It didn't seem normal to you. That's a normal reaction. Right. And I just, God, you know, heavens forbid, you know, I don't know if they had children, but remember those are the models that they had. Right. So now the children are going to continue this abusive pattern. Somebody has to stop it. We've got to stop the pattern that's happening because they won't know anything. They'll either get in an abusive relationship themselves and, or, or they'll be the abuser. And, and then the pattern keeps continuing, you know, down, down the generations. So no, of course it's not healthy. Just because they do it doesn't mean it's healthy. I know. And I knew the answer that it wasn't healthy, but I just like discussing these things because I feel like in my mind at that time, and there may be someone listening who feels this way, it was like, well, that doesn't seem right, but what if I'm wrong? And I'm expo- I was young. I was like, you know, my dad lived there when I was like, 19, 20, something like that. So I'm still exploring and figuring out what does a relationship look like? What does it mean? Is it okay to fight? And there are plenty of people that would say it's okay to have a healthy fight, but not a toxic fight. And so I just am interested in discussing like where the lines are. And I think that's why I keep bringing up these situations just so we can discuss them because I feel like Rosie, you are the person that can help all of us navigate our relationships and whether or not we need to get out. And this is why, you know, when I work with, because they're all confused or, you know, they've been in that toxic relationship where they haven't had a real voice. Um, They don't know what's important to them in a relationship. They don't even value themselves. They don't know, you know, how to establish their own boundaries. They can't say no, not even saying no to, you know, your, your partner, but just like, oh, I'm my, a boundary could be, I'm going to go out to, to lunch with my friends. And if he says no, it's like, yes, I have the right to go out to lunch with my friends. But if your husband or or partner says, you can't do that. And then you just, you know, and then you go in your room and cry, you're not honoring your boundaries. And then as soon as you do that, you become diminished and you feel bad and it just, and it just grows and grows. And a lot of women, you know, in particular, don't know how to ask what they, how to articulate. They can't even articulate what they want. And then to be actually like, ask it. First, they have to figure out how, what they want to ask and then how to actually ask for it. These are all skills that they're either not taught or they're, it was, <laughs> the ask was kicked out of them. <laughs> Do you like that? I love it. <laughs> no, I'm not a big comedian, but you know, I try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not either. Susie is way better at the one-liners. And then I'm always like, how can I be as funny as her? But you are amazing. You are hilarious. I really, really have appreciated our conversation today. It's not something that we talk about a lot. So that's probably why I kept asking more and more questions just to open up the discussion because we do so much on food and healing. But the truth is that none of that is going to work for people or apply to people if they are in this type of toxic relationship. Because even if you're changing your whole diet and becoming a raw vegan and exercising every day. If you're in a toxic relationship, you are going to be sick. You are going to be uncared for. You're going to be miserable. And I want to let everyone know that like your story shows us, we all have the power to get out. If you're in a, like I live in LA, if I wanted to move out right now, I can move out. You were in such dire circumstances, so alone, so detached from the world, so isolated, and you did it. And I just appreciate you as a testament to the fact that we can all do this if we need to. And most people's circumstances, I mean, I'm sure some, but the people who, who, who have worse circumstances than you did probably don't have access to listen to this podcast. So anyone listening, you can get out. Rosie can help you. Her book can help you. There are so many resources. And Rosie, please leave us with all of your resources, your website, how to get in touch with you, your Instagram, all that good stuff. Yeah, thank you. I mean, there is so much. And and really, this whole topic is about healing the whole person, isn't it? Yes. You know, it is about, I mean, it's it's, it's not through food per se, but it is about healing. And I listen to your thing, your, your, your podcast a lot. So this is the inner core of healing a human being. We're talking about the human being. So yeah, my, the website is 11 hours to freedom.com. You can, they can get a, their free gift. They can go, they can do 11 hours to freedom.com forward slash gift. And I have a little PDF for them called, you know, how to confidently ask for what you want. And I give them, you know, several, several ways to start setting up of how you can get the courage and set it up so you can actually ask for it 
and and get what you're asking for. And it's not that hard. And I've worked with you know a number of clients, even they're happily married, but still afraid to ask. And we have to move beyond that. It's just part of sharing our voice. I love that. Thank you so much. Is there any uh, last words of wisdom or advice you want to leave us with? Well, I do, but I want to ask one more thing. We have the Love is Kind movement. It's on Facebook group called the Love the Love is Kind movement. And we would just be so honored if you and Susie and your listeners joined us. It's our movement. Our mission is to save a million and more women and their children from this insidious abuse and to get the word out, to start the dialogue that love is kind and not terrorizing. We're here to make this a kinder world. Absolutely. Well, just keep continuing on that mission. We're so grateful to have you. Oh, thank you. You guys are super califragilisti expedalita, which is amazing. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>! <laughs> All right. I'll see you next time I'm in San Diego. Will you be at New Media Summit? Yes, I am. All right. I'll be there too. Woo-hoo. See you then. Awesome. Love it. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put down the Ben & Jerry's, get off the couch, and take a walk outside. If you experience any of these symptoms, tell your Facebook friends immediately.